Good morning. Welcome to Galway Politics Live. And today we're discussing the environment. Um, Mike Gerty, my co-host, isn't going to introduce our guests. Good morning, Neil. Good morning, viewers, and welcome to Galway Politics Live. So this morning we have two guests. Uh, we have Caroline Stanley from Friends of Merlin Woods, who's also co-chair of the Galway Environmental Network with us. And we have uh, Saoirse McHugh, a recent candidate in the European elections, and a member of the Green Party, and also a member of the board of Organic Growers of Ireland. So you're both very, very welcome. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Um, Sirisha, would you like to maybe tell us a bit about yourself? Um, yeah, okay, so thanks for having me. I grew up in Ackle and I suppose I've always been an environmentalist even before you know you put a name like that on it. Mm. And how I had gotten around to getting into politics was um, being involved in different things, I suppose. During my master's I came back and started working with the Seed Savers and they just had their funding cut, which was a quarter of a million a year and the same year that a big beef genomic scheme got 623 million and this is like the only heritage seed bank in Ireland mm. so that's when I started writing letters to politicians and getting in contact and from there that never stopped until one of them said to me well why don't why don't you run for us um, and that's how I ended up in politics and I'm still kind of just <laughs> figure I don't even feel like I'm in yeah. politics I'm still kind of trying to figure it out yet. Okay, very good, very good. So that's where I am at the well, moment. You did very, very well on your first run, so in the European elections. Well done. I was shocked, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's obviously a lot more to come in the future, Saoirse. Um, yeah, I, th I think I'll give it another go. Excellent, excellent. Definitely. Give like it another go? Which, which, um, in which environment, which political environment would you give it another go? The I doll, perhaps? I think I'd go for the doll. Now, obviously, mm. like, the Mayo Greens would have to select me. Um, so you've given away already which constituency you might consider. <laughs> oh, I'd have to Mayo. Mayo? Yeah. Mayo all the way. I live in Mayo. Perfect. <laughs> and and like I look at Mayo and geez, if you can get a green seat in Mayo, you can get, you can a, green get a green seat, seat on anywhere. the moon. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so and no I think disrespect to Mayo or anything like that. No, no disrespect at all. Um, so I think I'd definitely give it a go. Excellent. Just to see. Excellent. Yeah. You know. Very well. The best of luck with it, Saoirse. Um, so Caroline, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, I'll talk really about my environmental background, which I kind of started with uh, Friends of Merlin Woods, but seven years ago, I was always kind of involved in activism and social kind of worldwide problems that were going on. But I was kind of looking at, I may as well start my own backyard and try and work yep. that way because you can't solve all the world's problems, do you know? Ah, go on, Caroline. Surely a <laughs> woman of we your ability now could do that. So really how we started with Friends of Merlin Woods was really the litter was such an issue. So it really didn't start as a kind of an environmental group, just started looking at the litter problem. And from that we found out about the road going through it. Mm -hmm. So we had to run a campaign then to remove this road from the middle of the road, from the woodland. And that was a two year campaign. So it was straight in campaigning, you know, we didn't realise that we were going to end up as a campaign group trying to protect the woodlands and trying to think of ways, inventive ways to get people involved, get people to love the woodlands. So we started taking a lot of photo uh, photographs, organising events, biodiversity weeks, heritage week events, that kind of stuff. And mm. um, we've been doing that for about seven years. And then we also had our campaign then to protect the meadows, you know, which was kind of controversial because it was uh, because Goway Hospice wanted to build on the meadows. And of course, people couldn't believe that we would go up against a hospice. And, you know, the, our our thing was we were not against a hospice. We're against destroying natural habitats that we very little of these Annex 1 habitats in the city. So we brought our case to on board Panola because it had been approved by the city council and we won it. We won, so we managed to protect the and meadows. What was the reason that you did win it? Because, I mean, obviously, uh, because of, of the Goa City Development Plan. So Basically, it was contrary to the Galway it City It was contrary to the Galway City Development Plan, and it was also because we'd proven that it was an Annex 1 
Meadows ourselves, mm. plus also some information that was there from when they were doing, trying to decide which routes the motorway, the new ring road was going to go. They had done some environmental assessments on loads of different areas across the city, and one of those had pointed out that it was a priority Annex 1 habitat. So really weren't there loads of other places the hospice could have gone, for goodness sake? There was. And I mean, there was 84 acres in the Merlin Park Hospital itself, which we'd always pointed out that they could build on and also you know we've never actually objected to any development within the hospital grounds that the complex mm. itself has like 84 acres so our thing was you know stick to where um, land is zoned for building on and stop trying to rezone more recreational land you know at the, and that and in the same year 60 acres across the city was rezoned you know green belt land and now we're into the crisis you know that our habitats mm. we need as much green land as possible within urban environments you know that's one of the things that came out of the IPBES report this year you know was was about urban green belts and green infrastructure and how important it was within cities you know so yeah well there's a be beautiful orchard field <laughs> a few yards away from us here where there's plans to put student accommodation now yeah. you know th this goes on and on is this just not an interminable conflict i mean we had rossport and mayo um you know and anything you'd like to mention about that um well i was i wasn't politically involved at the time i was quite young um but in retrospect i just actually read lorna siggins did a really good book mm. um once upon a time in the west yeah. that's right yeah. Yeah. it is yeah. Uh, just just an aside on that it is a remarkable feat of uh, recording and accounting and like mm. such very such mixed timelines but you know a lot of the issue there is you know there are arguments for housing now I don't believe it has to be on um, Greenland but what Shell was what that Carob field mm. was mm. was um, barefaced just a bid for a giant company to make more money like they couldn't even make and they did try make these oh the um the energy security of of ireland or oh, the something something our economy or oh, they'll be mm. and the jobs but when you when you get down to it and when you look at what ireland does get from oil and gas fines which is nothing um that was just a large company coming in and using a very willing state surprisingly so um which i think is the key point you're making the very willing state as opposed to shocking reading some of the might stuff actually ask a few questions yeah. well and you know you do you always kind of imagine you hear about these kind of you know you hear companies bulldozing over communities in different countries and you kind of have this oh but this wouldn't happen in ireland mm. um but the the violence that the state used and the fact that the state went above and beyond what was called for in facilitating shell mm. um is was i suppose really kind of uh, eye-opening for a lot of people and in retrospect i think it did totally turn a lot of people from, from, may, from maybe forever against any notions of the Irish state as this kind of benevolent mm. um, we're not like the rest of them state that we kind of push an awful lot so while yes maybe this battle between human expansion and the natural world can be f definitely framed as just a necessary on the books we have to accept this as a battle it doesn't have to be that way and usually when it is a battle the crux of it is not any sort of human need it's usually profit yeah. mm. and yeah so how are we going to solve this climate change issue if oh. that's the case <laughs> god knows but even with connemara you know the the mining yeah. Mm -hmm. prospects you know i mean that was very so what, what, tell us a bit about that caroline i mean what, well, what is the what plan for mining reading, you know i haven't really had time to kind of yeah. get personally involved because that's and also i think it's up to local people to really stand their ground yeah. and they were amazing really the, mm. the stuff that went on with the locals and how they rallied together mm. you know and they've uh, defeated or they've had one license one mining license it's been revoked or the prospecting has been revoked so 
there's a couple of more there, but they're such a good, they've got such a strong community, you know, in a rural community as well. And they've all come together and, you know, that is about saving the environment. It's about saving their water. It's about saving themselves from pollution mm -hmm. and destructive forces. And tourism is such a vital industry. And, uh, and in terms of climate, industry. I mean, what's the relevance to climate specifically? For the, for the mining? Mm. Well, I, with, it, with climate, Mm. I'd say more on the environment and not the environment in general. In, yeah. in general, you know, yeah, I, the I local mean, environment. obviously, I think what's going to happen more and more is uh, countries are going to, you know, some countries are going to protect themselves environmentally. And what you're going to have is governments start looking inner mm. into themselves. You know, where are these mineral resources coming for our phones, our laptops, all this kind of stuff, you know, for even for some of the green energy you know, some of the green cars, all that kind of Batteries. stuff. You know, we need these uh, resources. Mm. And they just seem to keep continuing with this mining, you know. I mean, I thought it was actually quite strange a few years ago that no one really picked up on it when they changed the Department of Envi Environment's title and yeah. they put in natural resources. They removed environment for a while. Didn't yeah, they? Okay. and they put in uh, natural resources in the title there. And then they had this mapping program going on across mm. the, the country. And I went, that's not been done for the good of the environment. That's been done so that they can see what's under the ground and what's mm -hmm. mineable. You know, well, really. Isn't uh, Sean Sean Kine? Wasn't he just at a um, oh, like an industry miners evil corp are us <laughs> kind of like meeting over in I think it was Canada recently, okay. and yeah. they once again voted that <coughs> Ireland was the most fiscally attractive um, mining area, and I think we're the most second, the second most fiscally attractive. Um, country in the world for oil and gas mining. Right. Now, when you say fiscally attractive, what do you mean exactly? Oh, tax we're reasons. Tax reasons, yeah. like even looking at our oil and gas fines, the the amount they're pushing, exploring. Mm -hmm. They're yes. desperate to find something here because we only tax them after is it a certain amount of time? Yeah. And af and but even then, any cost put in can be written off against it. Mm. Um, and like that in terms of mining i think there's a whole range of tax benefits and we go above and beyond in just facilitating and streamlining the process and uh, removing any requirement for environmental impact assessments yeah. and really like pathetic kind of I don't, a boot lickery i don't even know what you'd call it <laughs> i don't know why i don't know like, are there actually these really, you know, suave mining lobbies walking into <laughs> these into offices and taking people out on fancy mm. dinners and blackmailing them? Like, I don't know why we persist across the board, um, especially environmentally, with bowing to large industry. Mm. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. You know, and then we're all like wiping away tears in 1916 commemoration <laughs> things. And I'm like, mm. I don't know if that spirit is really kind of there, actually. Um, so I don't know why we do it, why we are consistently like seen as, oh yeah, they're great. They're great for mm. companies, but you know, we do it with data as well. Yeah. yeah. Data well, you're in, you're in the right place for data anyway. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's, what's your view on the data? I don't know actually much about our regulations of on data, but I, you know, you, I was reading a, a summarized article for someone like me who, as soon as they start talking, even in amounts of data, I'm. I don't know what that fully means, um, but on us having really low restrictions. One of the big issues with data, I find, is I was just reading it the last day, actually, it was a Patrick Bresnahan wrote about it in the Irish Times. He was saying that um, if everything goes ahead mm -hmm. by 2027, 20, I think, 31 percent of Ireland's energy demand will be for data, data centres. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is. It is the use of data, yeah. Because we we had a talk here recently which said that um, we're heading towards four percent of the world's climate um, emissions mm -hmm. are actually coming going to be coming from data centres yeah. very yeah. shortly. And I, I did this rough and re ready calculation because we'd had a previous discussion that two percent is the figure of the total emissions from all the seaborne transport in the world mm -hmm. currently. 
So it's actually double seaborne transport. Jesus. And when you consider that roughly 50% of all data, th th this is the funny thing now, is, is videos of cats. You know, we can say that, that the videos not. of cats, we're getting there, you know, fif almost 50%. Th th this is a bit rough and ready and I'm, I'm not going to be quoted on it. But we can <laughs> say that, that uh, well, I mean, I'm already quoted live on it. But I mean, we, we, we could conclude that, you know, seaborne shipping emits the same thing as videos of cats the same amount of emissions and wow. I mean that's kind of shocking it is, yeah. but a huge amount of data storage actually is videos now at this stage yeah. it's personalized videos and a huge amount of those videos are nice yeah. happy and yeah. and not videos. only are we you know using that much energy for our data centers but we're paying for those data centers mm. as public mm. you know because our electricity bills are topped up with more and more taxes carbon taxes mm -hmm. and we're paying for more and more energy creation you know for wind service windmill services all that kind of stuff so wind power services you know so we're paying more and I more mean, the, you know the internet is becoming more and more popular we are we using are we using use more and more data but is the data centers supplying ireland or is the data centers that we're bringing into this country supplying the rest of the world well as far as i know they're supplying the world yeah I mean, you know so maybe that's something oh, we need to consider them. yeah maybe tax them <laughs> but should we stop them i mean should we close down facebook for example we're broadcasting on facebook live mm -hmm. and we're adding to um that that those data mm -hmm. centers you know we're adding to that data yeah but I, I still don't think it means that companies should be given absolutely free reign to do whatever they mm -hmm. want I don't think it means that the uh, company should have members that sit on boards that decide the regulation absolutely. of this data I think they should be taxed I think they should be broken up like mm -hmm. the absolute size of them um, is I suppose unprecedented I think now obviously I don't know enough about data and how it's used and the rules around it but they should be tighter. But why aren't the companies broken up? Like it's it's preposterous that you have companies mm. that have GDPs bigger than countries. Um, so if we allow them, that's fine. But we, I feel Ireland especially has to stop bending over backwards for like, what was that? Uh, that article just said recently that 75% of our investment into this country is phantom. It leaves again like it's, yeah. it's just <coughs> tagged in one door and out the other. Like, come on. <laughs> That's nonsense, isn't it? Well, it's not keeping our tax base going. Yeah, yeah which is wrong. Mm. But like, it's not like we don't know this. It's not like we're like, oh, we're so helpless. Oh, please. Oh, we don't <laughs> know what to do. Uh, just figure it out and change it. And we will have to wean ourselves off it. But like, we've no protection. You know, we're like, oh, but like, you know, our tax base, yada, yada, yada. And it's like, they could leave tomorrow yeah. if they like. All another other country has to do is lower their tax bases yeah. they'll just go there what are, what are we left with we're we've not created any homegrown industry you know we've well not i mean there's many people who dispute that very that's little it. how much investment are we you know we don't invest as mm -hmm. much as we do in our corporates you know mm -hmm. ida i i think you get shag all return for being a, a tax haven mm -hmm. yeah like so you'd, you'd encourage more Irish entrepreneurs, local Irish entrepreneurs and circular economy type of things? Yeah, than absolutely. Yeah. Foreign investment, which is... I think foreign investment is good, but as, as Saoirse said, it needs to be taxed. Mm. You know, they, it can't just be, you know, and I think they, that's the argument is they go, if we tax them, they're going to leave. Yeah. You know, they're going to leave if someone else offers them cheaper tax. Our GDP went up something <laughs> like 17% um, one of the recent years and was based on... I think a single aircraft leasing company yeah. coming to Ireland, yeah. or most of it was. Yeah. Now, I mean, that helped us a lot in terms of our <coughs> repayments, um, you know, to based on GDP because it, it reduced our debt to GDP ratio. But it's not reflected so it's on the ground, you know, where people are struggling <coughs> in everyday lives. You know, you know, there's a big difference going on here. Mm. Is who's making the money? It's certainly not your average person on the ground. You know, most people are struggling, and this is a problem we're going to face more and more as the climate as climate change impacts us. You know, we're talking about trying to change the public transport. You know, but we've not invested in any of this. Ireland has been fined left, right, and centre because it's it's not standing up to its ob obligations under the EU. You know, with all the money that's been paid out, that's going to be paid out in fines. We could be investing, you know. What have we done in Galway for public transport? Well, what have we done in Galway? What have for we done transport? for it? Like, you know, what have we done in Mayo? 
<laughs> for public, public transport. transport. Like, you know, is there public transport? Oh, I think there's not people much to talk through. about, yeah. Mm. Um, but, but on that, whatever about what we refuse to tax, allowing companies hide profits here that should be taxed elsewhere mm. is not our decision to make. It's not our decision to say, okay, um, we think that Apple or Amazon or Facebook or whoever shouldn't pay wages, shouldn't pay tax in these countries so they can just like move it through us. But you know, what we're effectively doing is allow is facilitating these companies stealing from, mm -hmm. you know, infrastructure and healthcare and environmental funds mm -hmm. and all of these things mm -hmm. in different countries. So it's not like we're like, oh well sure, aren't we so cute? <laughs> you know, we've a load of jobs. We're also facilitating these companies who don't give they don't care about Ireland at all and they're, mm. they leave again and um, so we're not even winning you know we're not even you know this kind of like oh aren't we so cute idea mm. we have mm. like look at all the foreign direct investment we've got um you know we're not winning and we're also just facilitating enormous companies rob the world mm. you know <laughs> so maybe back to the transport issue as well <laughs> please, <Sergio. laughs> uh, we were talking there about uh, public transport and 50 countries around the world have free public transport yeah how do you think that would work in ireland so Saoirse, do you want to take it first um i suppose i think it would work brilliantly in places like dublin galway <laughs> cork you know in the in cities. cities but until climate action I think is mainstreamed into town and rural planning because as it stands you know we're not looking at what the kind of spread out into the countrysides into like this ribbon development is doing to our towns mm -hmm. and our villages and what it is doing of course is it's hollowing out the center of them mm -hmm. and then you get a big tesco plonking itself out on the outskirts with a load of park and then you're if yeah. you live way out if you live 20 minutes outside you're just going to go into tesco because mm -hmm. it's easier so so this is the bypass thing yeah you have to bypass around yeah. on the tesco beside and it, until yeah. things like road building is not just looked at in terms of oh this will shorten the distance between so and so and so and so what will this do to the towns that it bypasses and then what happens is you get populations that are practically impossible to serve for public transport because mm -hmm. they're so dispersed um mm -hmm where walking and cycling is practically impossible. Like my cousin lives in um, just outside Mitchellstown okay. in Tipperary and the road they live on, I think they're about five miles outside, but it's a fast road with big hedgerows right to the end side of the road. You can't walk on it, yeah. you can't cycle. Um, and so I think town planning will be vital in <coughs> making public transport even doable in rural areas like I was in the Faroe Islands there two years ago and they have little villages but that's what they have they have little villages and they have an excellent public transport system mm -hmm. okay. um, in the Faroes yeah it's fantastic yeah. and they're road building they mm. they'll build tunnels under the sea or through a mountain to stop one village emptying out totally like that's a village of 500 yeah. people and they'll keep yeah. they'll keep them there um, but their public transport is really, really impressive. So it's it's not even a matter mm. of population, but it's it's how you plan that population and mm. wash the. P I think planning offices are going to be vital in climate action in general because I also think that that living density really affects agriculture. Yeah, but we can go on to that later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Transport. It's interesting that you mentioned tunnels. All right, <coughs> you know, when it wasn't normally considered here in Galway when the bypass was brought in. Yeah. You know, and you have the Jack Lynch Tunnel and you have the Dublin Tunnel, all these tunnels, you know, yeah. so it wasn't nobody looked at here, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Caroline, what do you think of the public transport uh, well, uh, being free? Uh, obviously with the city and I live in Dewishka, so we <laughs> have like the fantastic Dewishka 409 bus service, you know, which yep. goes and every 12 fantastic? minutes. And it is fantastic, but then it gets caught in the traffic on the mm. Dublin Road. But we will be having a new bus corridor because I was actually contacted about it because running down the Dublin Road. Mm. Um, on the other side of the Dublin, so we'll have two bus lanes on the Dublin Road. So that is something that's coming in the pipeline. But like we need loads of 409s across the city, you know, they're talking about traffic. You know, I can't see how this ring road is going to take any of that city traffic out of the city, really, you know, because especially in tourist season, race week, all that, mm -hmm. it doesn't stop any of it. And I know there's been calls for like um, train services or the rail link and stuff through the light rail light rail mm -hmm. 
And I think that would be great, you know, because you see it in this. So for cities, it's much more accessible to get public transport. For the towns, I think what you've got to, like they're talking about things like park and ride, you know. Yeah. But they're talking about park venues. and ride and it's about two mile, two or three miles outside the city. Mm-hmm. And that to me is ridiculous. Park and ride should be about 15 miles outside the city, you know, in the satellite villages, towns. So you but can if drive there were a few to park the and rides, it would make it a lot easier. If you had yeah. them all around the city, you know, if there's yeah. that much traffic coming, you know, I mean, the tomb road never, never quite. Yeah. Well, if you, you take, know, take Galway, the ba- you're talking Berna, Mike Cullen. Yeah. You know, tomb you're road, talking about uh, the Orn Moor, all the, yeah. the traffic. Like it could, be, it could be going so back 10, 15 miles. Actually, hits the traffic in the first place. Yes, before the traffic. Mm. You know, then you get on a bus. Yeah. Or but that's where light rail would work in Galway. But like what they're considering now is is they're considering park and rides just maybe two miles outside the city so yeah. to me that's just that's just uh, kicking the can down the road here's a bit of land that we own as the city council we'll put a park and ride there and you're going but the traffic's 15 miles the other way so what are you going to do sit in the traffic for a half an hour and then get it out of your car and get on a bus you've already and your work is only five minutes away like will, will park and <laughs> ride actually work though caroline i mean because i mean you know, the, the problem with it is nobody's going to get on a bus if it's just going to bring them into the tra- the same traffic they'd be in in their car anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you've got dedicated... Oh, you need the bus routes. You're going to make it quicker. Yeah, but I mean those... But you need those first, really, don't you? You need the bus routes, but I think, you know, there's other things to consider, like, you know, even watching a lot of the housing and stuff that's going mm. up around the city, like, they're still not putting in cycle lanes. Mm. Mm. You know, they're still putting in just the normal footpath and... Yep. You're going, my God. Or indeed cycle lanes that nobody uses. Because you know, but they're, they're not putting in cycle. They're, they're not designed. putting, they're not saying to the the developers of the house, mm. you know, Merlin Lane said there was a lot of development went on d- down near us. And they could have easily have said to the owners who were built or the de- whoever was mm. building the houses that you need to leave enough space so we can put a, a cycle lane lanes. and a footpath there. We have a footpath, but no cycle lane. And loads of families use it. And we know it's a rat run, you know, yeah. for people getting through Dewishka into the Dublin Road, you know, mm. when the hospital is is open, so or when the the gates are open for the hospital. So it's just that's just planning doesn't seem to consider, as you say, the bigger picture. Mm. It's just piecemeal, 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 yeah. and we need to stop that kind of planning going on. As someone who loves driving, uh, yeah. I love my car like. <laughs> We, I was in the Green Party office one day and one of them goes, oh, do you want a bike cover uh, for your saddle? And I was like, <laughs> I don't have a bike. <laughs> and they were all like, <gasps> what? A green without a bike? <laughs> <laughs> How dare she? Um, you know, and, and from Ackle, you're always going to bring your car to somewhere. Like if I drove two hours, the idea then of stopping and getting on a park and ride, I'd be like, I just drive. And I think a lot of it in the end, like even, so my grandmother lives in Lucan, but it's 3.30 on a bus. So mm. the two of us go in and out. And one day, like that's so much money. Yeah. Um, and I think until cars are banned in certain parts of the city, yeah, people will because I would. I'm like, oh, it's so much easier driving in because yeah. we're used to it. Yeah. And we're also used to it. Or I've seen um, maps of Dublin where they've gotten the city and said, right, if you couldn't cross one axis and the other, so you'd have to go out and around and in, people would stop using the city just to go through. Yeah. Um that would make a huge difference but i think like you can make public transport as friendly as possible but until enough people are using it yeah that enough people are demanding it to be better mm. um and i don't think that'll happen until cars are just banned in certain parts of certain cities yeah yeah there's a car culture <coughs> and i'm sure it's very hard yeah. to change it yeah. Yeah. yeah so what about electric cars <laughs> well i i do think like they're you know they're everywhere in the government's plan mm-hmm. um and <laughs> they're still just switching one for the other like there's no fundamental shift in how we interact with the environment like that we'd still require more roads mm-hmm. it wouldn't do anything about traffic congestion it wouldn't do anything about pollution from brakes um, but it would presumably reduce carbon emissions to some extent yeah overall even it, it would but it's you know then what you've got is especially if it's renewable energy that's actually used as the electricity yeah but you, then you still have a society that is dependent on individual car use and still dependent on big car parks. And also it is putting the financial cost 
all the way down to the very bottom instead of saying right why don't we yeah, be really true. efficient about this and why don't we look at this through a much more kind of holistic way and instead of listening to the car dealerships why don't we say okay well let's just have a really really good public transport system and whoever still insists on having a private car they can go electric if they want but it's it will offer no reduction in energy usage and like obviously if we do move to all renewables and they work um that would be great but with our technologies we're going to need a massive reduction in consumption mm. um absolutely even if we move to renewables even if we look at nuclear even if we look at gas whatever like that's renewable um but i think it would moving to just electric cars would really miss like a really cool opportunity to reverse some of like the atomization of our societies and reverse this kind of driving home that this kind of neoliberal buy go back to your house in your own little car don't talk to your neighbors um but keep consuming you know climate change is a product of that is not just a product of cars and it is not just a product of uh, Tesco's and it is not just a product of whatever buying jewelry or flying in airplanes yeah. all of those are products of I think of that kind of 1980s Thatcherite there is no <laughs> such thing as society um, don't think about anyone else you've got your car go home and I think it, mm. you know apart from logistically and financially moving back towards public transport could participate or precipitate you know a shift in how our societies see itself even you know maybe yeah. we'll see that there is such a thing as society mm -hmm. you know I don't know. okay I, I just want to get on to you know very specifically to climate because I mean yeah. we have a we have a set of figures before us I mean 20% roughly is, is transport and um, a third is agriculture roughly um, and then energy production is uh, another 20 percent those are the biggest things by far in ireland um, at the moment now uh, a colleague of yours now alistair mckinstry who's recently elected well maybe mm. you wouldn't consider him a colleague but he's, he, he was elected for the green party mm. recently in connemara mm. basically um told me that the, if we don't get to be carbon neutral by 2040 what that does actually is it will lock in that cities like galway will actually be gone as a habitable piece of land yeah. by 2100. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people who, who may say, well, who cares about that? I'm not going to be here. But I'm not one of them, and I don't think any of us are one of them. Most people do actually care about grandchildren or great-grandchildren yeah. and, uh, you know, how things will be. But how the hell are we going to do this? I mean, you know, you're t we're talking about things like electric cars, or maybe we're not. We're talking about sort of more locally based. But even at the best estimates, surely, you know, going from 20% uh, carbon emissions, having that is going to be a huge difference in our lifestyle. If we have half as much transport as we currently use, carbon-based transport, how are we going to actually do that, Caroline? Well, as well as, as, well as re reducing our con own consumptions and government action, I think you have to start looking at your habitats and restoring your green infrastructure because I think really we've got to think how the hell do we absorb all this carbon or how do we absorb all this flood water you know and we really start to think about rewilding areas you know hate some people go oh, rewilding you know or re letting areas regenerate you know i mean we're cutting our grasses within an inch of it of its life our farmers are clearing some of their their land because of, po of policies you know their hedgerows you know I, I was passing a field the other day and it had a big floodplain in the middle but there wasn't one tree around the edge of it and I was going geez if they had 30 or 40 willows in that there wouldn't be a flood water in the middle of that mm -hmm. field you know and that land would be usable you know and it's very some some of it's very simple policies but we seem to be regressing and you're taking out all the things that are flooding flooding the landscape first of all you know i was in cumbria there not so long ago and i mean talk about sheep farming you know there was no was lake district yeah no trees or anything on the hills and you're and they were talking about floods you know down in their villages and i was going well 
what's stopping the water from coming down the hills like you know you've just got is it drained land that we're talking about it's just cleared it i mean if if anyone uh, anyone sees sheep in a field you know they're fairly eat everything like i'm just back you know. from a conference in germany where we were told that roughly um peatland actually sequest or, or produces yeah. five times more carbon than forested areas yeah. so i mean peatland is something we have roughly 20 percent of ireland is yeah peatland. absolutely and I think it's 0.3% of the world's surface area, um, which is disrupted peatland, is providing 5% of all carbon emissions on an annual basis. So surely the rewetting of, mm. you know, yeah. the, I, I, ha all habitats of that. seem to be whatever I think. I think what people have got to realise is we need all sorts of habitats to survive. Mm. You know, we can't just have blanket forestry mm -hmm. because then if you haven't got the meadows and the hedgerows and that you know you don't have the insects you know they need open land we need birds of prey need open land you know so how mm. do we keep everything ticking over we need a, a wide variety of habitats to keep it going and we could do that quite well and this, and and with our agriculture as well you know we see things like the burn project how they work you know and that seems to be a good model that's work and keep and the farmers are happy with so like couldn't we do that on a wider scale within ireland as well you know and like the forestry you know, 70% to be conifers. And those conifers have to be sprayed because of the diseases that they get, mm. which means that the water, that the pollute, <coughs> the pesticides that they're using are washing into our water, so we're poisoning our own water. We're clear felling, so any of that carbon that was stored will be cut down and then you have to, you know, you know, it's just... And they tend to be put in bogs, which actually, yeah. and put which actually emits carbon. Yeah. You know, it, it, uh, even though the conifers are there, yeah. there's net emissions going yeah. on, yeah. Yeah. So maybe kind you of have insane. Yeah. Well, Sucha. like when you look at Ireland, and maybe this sounds a bit negative, there is, n we don't need to invent any policy. There's a country in the world doing any area of policy better than Ireland. Like we can make huge steps just like plagiarising policies. Absolutely. Um, like we, this, this doesn't need, you know, big mm -hmm. think-ins. We can say, yeah, okay, is. what are like probably the Swedes doing, you know, and rob <laughs> their policy. Yeah. Um, and there is nothing there's no area there whereby another country isn't already really really reducing it like our agriculture for instance yeah talk to us about that because i mean what is it 33 percent most of that is is basically cows emitting methane yeah yep. i don't we don't have to go into how they emit methane but they do yeah um so the pressure on is to cull the herd is that the right thing to do well i think the herd will have to be reduced um like you know, you but surely consumption, this is what farmers say, if consumption isn't reduced and we just import cattle from Brazil, which are produced by cutting down rainforests, that's not going to solve the problem, is it? E no, it's not going to. But that's also such a false argument. Like I don't believe that Michael Creed cares so much about the Amazon that he is willing to risk Ireland's international reputation. I suppose the fact of the matter is none of these, you know, demand, everyone knows this, demand just doesn't like, you know, grow itself. Mm. Ireland aggressively pursues the expansion of beef and dairy markets across the world. Mm. And we, uh, you know, we're like, oh, prime Irish beef. We're looking to fill the top end of those markets. And every time you open a market and you fill the top end, it's going to be filled from the bottom up. And pursuing this like meatification i suppose meatification <laughs> is a great new word for go away <laughs> politics now of, of diets like Deep. even if you look at like what did we have there when i was young milk in schools yeah okay that is not a normal thing that was created you look at the food pyramid this yeah. is created by the grain industries of the u.s you know none of these none of these things just happen and the other thing to remember when you're talking about agriculture in Ireland, because it's become such a flashpoint, is it's not working for the majority of farmers. Mm. So as it stands now, we have 90,000 suckler farmers who between expansion of the dairy herd, um, Mercosur, mm -hmm. or the threat of Mercosur, and Brexit, are like, oh my God, we have, you know, we have, we have nothing. So many of them are looking at selling off their land. Yeah. and. Then the farming independent, I think it was, had a like hand rubbing in anticipation article there a couple of months ago about the, how there'll be great opportunities for dairy farm expansion yeah. when all these suckler farmers sell up. 
and it was like oh so we're back to talking about land consolidation and how awesome it is um it's not working and farmers have been forced into a particular type of agriculture and it can't be just oh let's cull the herd i think that will eventually happen a reduction of the herd will have to happen but we do need farmers on the land like the idea to me of further consolidation of land so we have like four or five huge farmers in ireland is horrifying yeah absolutely. you know it'll be vital to keep farmers on the land but it'll be also vital then to totally rearrange our relationship with food and yeah. that will have to be done governmentally um well in germany what one of the interesting things they they were saying they were doing you were talking about policies from other countries is they're looking at the concept of carbon credits for farmers, like car carbon farming, effectively, mm -hmm. mm. that in certain lands where they can actually sequester a lot of carbon or reduce the amount of carbon emitted, that they actually pay people to to um, farm sphagnum, for example, which sequesters a lot of carbon, or yeah. indeed plant forests is, is yeah. another thing you can do, depending on what whether the land is suitable mm -hmm. for um, forestry. You know, so I mean, is is that something that you could see Irish farmers doing, being guardians of, um, well, guardians of the galaxy, maybe, but guardians <laughs> of, uh, you know, um, carbon farming or carbon? Yeah, but I, I think like I'm always wary of you know the further financialization of things, because um, once yeah. once you can buy it, someone else with more money can buy it too. Um, and well, you can't buy extra land, really. I mean, mm. we've got a limit to the amount of land available on the planet. No, but what might happen would be then you just get a few farmers who can afford to buy carbon credits yeah. and expand massively. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I do think, I know I keep hammering on about it, but I do think these two things are tied. Like, you know, we can't talk about the environment without talking about capitalism um, and, and how that pushes us in certain ways. Like, what I would love to see would be a lot more locally focused agriculture and a lot more democratically controlled agriculture. So... You know, and I've heard people saying on Twitter, oh, so I own the land, but everyone else tells me what to do. And currently they own the land, but like enormous Chinese companies that buy powdered milk tell them what to do. So I don't see what the huge <laughs> issue is. Yeah. Um, and obviously that phrasing of it, you know, you're supposed to be like, no, of course not. But what I am talking about is that all of us interact with food, all of us interact with the land and we both and a farmer, you know, relies on the people. And if we could you know, regulate the hell out of supermarkets so they can't force really restrictive contracts. Or if we could, you know, scale health and safety regulations so that farmers can sell a large amount from farm gate. Mm. Or if we could get communities to say, actually, no, we do want, we, we do want to support you and say 50 people go together, go to one farmer and say, right, this is what we'll have for the year. Mm. You know, there's so many ways of making agriculture responsive to both the environment and the community without a loss in quality of life for anyone but as it stands the power rests with meat processors further increasingly so with live export companies and with enormous corporations yeah. you know that and that's just, it's just wrong because they don't respond to the environment and they don't respond to people okay i wanted to address just change the subject slightly one, it would be remiss of us not to sort of just have a quick look at plastics because plastics yeah, have yeah. been clogging up our environment. They've been heavy in the, <coughs> in the media. You know, the, the, the European Union looks like it's actually moving to end, um, as David Attenborough has called it, single-use plastic mm -hmm. and the use in the European Union of single-use plastic. I presume you'd be in favour of that, both of you, but do you think it's realistic? Oh, I'd, I'd hope it was realistic at this stage, you know, cleaning up litter out of Merlin Wood for seven years and finding <laughs> all that plastic. I'm sick of it. And uh, and you think if there was less one-off plastic available for purchase, well, uh, there'd be less litter? Yeah, I just think it's absolutely ridiculous, to be honest, mm. the amount what of plastic. Of I just I just can't believe that we're still here trying to fight for it, you know, and we have a bill in the dole trying to get through as a deposit return scheme. And we're, you know, it's worked in country, other countries. You know, we had it in this country when I was growing up in the 80s where you brought back your bottles and stuff and got a few what pence or whatever. You know, the place was actually, we were all cleaning up the streets because you could make some money out of it, you know. And why things like that cannot be brought in. But it's the packaging and all that kind of waste and stuff that's yeah. coming in as well. You know, we really need to 
and it's and it's not people cannot you know they can bring their you know little have a plastic bin and you can put all your plastics into it but that's not good enough you know why are not the larger manufacturers made you know why shouldn't they be taxed mm. on their on the well, more plastic that they should we be in the first place though I mean should we you know should we this be forced on us you know because you can't exactly buy a packet of crisps in the old fashioned sort of uh, paper um, grease proof paper type of packet that you used to be able to I don't really? know, but you could. There's plenty of uh, ingenious scientists out there coming up with better and better pl types of plastic. So, mm -hmm. you know, why can't we? But any any type of plastic surely is one-off plastic. It depends on uh, you know. There's stuff being made that's uh, biodegradable, bi biodegradable. Mm -hmm. and I'm not you know, and I, my bugbear is biodegradable coffee cu coffee cups. You know that everyone <laughs> buys and goes or compostable coffee c coffee cups and they can only be compostable if you bring them to the right place in one in one premises in the UK or something you know and people are <laughs> fooled into buying these compostable cups I you know where's the bloody pottery cups gone or the <laughs> your glass yeah. cups gone you know every ca ca Well the other danger of course we find that um, you know corn oil produced in South America again chopping down rainforests to do it being used to produce these biodegradable plastic yeah. goods, you know, is, is that the way forward? No, absolutely not, you know, I suppose I think we've just got to get out of using plastics and try and go what back to containers. What about the aspect of it though? I mean, you know, is the way forward not reusable? Yeah, reusable but where are those plastics made from? What You know, they're coming from oil industry as Pearl well. Oil, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so I ban. mean just ban. really, we got to start <laughs> We've got a plastic bag tax, <laughs> yeah, 20 yeah. years in the making, yeah. and then overnight it became ceasing you know, problem. It's in living memory mm. when people could survive, and people survived for thousands, of oh, tens Th of thousands yeah. of years. And most people in the planet don't consume and run through plastic like we do here. Mm. Just ban them. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's so easy. Just do I it remember like. fighting with shop assistants for well over a decade trying to say, look here I have my bag and I'm going to put the stuff into it yeah. and they said no you have to take these they're hygienic you know it's, it's all to do with hygiene yeah. and yeah. safety you know and if you're using these bags yeah. it's a problem but I don't think there's too many people use plastic bags at checkouts anymore are there and we're not all dying no from, from it's fine I think most people bring their own at this stage don't they yeah yeah, yeah that's what you know Could we well. not do that for oranges and yeah, I think potatoes, everything, yeah. like everything. Yeah. Why can't we just get our own paper yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, bring our own bags into the supermarket. You know, really you get a uh, scoop your crisps out if you want some crisps. Yeah. <laughs> get rid of the like, foil wrapped crisps. And if you ban <laughs> them, if you ban them, would would that not potentially have some sort of repercussions, health and safety? Um, whatever is, is there is there any reason that we wouldn't continue to do things the way <laughs> well, we do? Well, any health possible health and safety repercussions has to be overshadowed by what would happen if we don't ban them which is like we'll all choke and go extinct on this like <laughs> barren wasteland where fish are just floating by dead <coughs> and nothing survives and Should the microplastics you know that's in our soil we're actually they are we're actually it's in our own Please, system yeah who's wearing a face Synthetic. <laughs> <laughs> Again, there now, yeah. Just checking the feet. So you know where we are. <laughs> oh, Mike! Mike is having a, having <laughs> a, 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 a replay. Yes. An action Mike replay. I think it was. Yeah. We yeah. just had to say that twice. Yes. Yeah. It was so good, Caroline. <laughs> we so had to say it twice. twice. <laughs> so, so seriously, says ban them. What do you think, Caroline? Do you think just? Yeah, I'd be on the case for banning as much plastic as possible. Get it out of. I mean, when you see these these dead fish, you know, or dead whales that. Oh, it's just shocking. David Attenborough has produced to the world you know it's just shocking plastic. like we're gonna have babies being born with plastics that comes from the mothers mm. in ourselves yeah. you know we're all they're already seen it mm. you know so is that what people really want in their with in the future with their children we're actually mm. <laughs> oh here we go another action replay <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, we're checking for messages. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is there any other any other sort of pressing environmental issue that either, before we just finish up that either of you would like to raise? Oh, everything! I don't know. My I mean, whole, my whole we could be here for really hours, you know, talking about the environment and the dangers of, to, to us. But I mean, give give us the thing that you're most passionate about, perhaps. Environmentally, mm. um, even if it's local. It probably would be agriculture mm -hmm. and our relationship with the land and with 
the animals on it. Um, and I do think it comes from, and this might be getting like a bit too far for this <laughs> podcast, but I do think a lot of it comes from, you know, a really, it's couched in quite a white supremacist kind of attitude towards the world. Agriculture. Like how we look at our world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it is the same as how over the years, women, people of color have been seen as at different stages, um, totally irrelevant, no voice, property in cases. Um, and like, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I'm saying I think it comes from the same place because the domination and use of nature um, and total eradication of any of its own kind of selfness, like it being something that, you know, has an existence uh, outside of how we own it or how we can use it. Mm. Um, I think that comes from the same place. But I suppose my, my hobby hobby horse would be that capitalism is incompatible with life on Earth. Right. Right. Yeah. So just just quickly, I mean, what sort of agriculture would you like to see? I mean, what would be sort of an, a vision would be darling buds of May? I don't know if you ever, ever no, saw I that particular thing. That that it's sort of a, a very sort of, um, I, I suppose, localized organic type of agriculture that. Yeah, I think it would have to be a type of agriculture that recognizes the rights of other aspects of this world. So, the, you know, there's a there's a rights of nature movement. Mm. Um, and it is a bit and it's a blind spot, I think, for politicians and people on the left as well, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit like, oh, whoa, that's <laughs> a bit out there. But I think that, yeah, recognizing us as part of something, that shift in thinking will be necessary to move towards any other type of agriculture. And as for what type, you know, I think that will be decided at quite a regional level, but it will have to be mm. democratic and it will have to be environmentally sustainable and there are thousands of examples of this there are farms in ireland where people are farming in a really positive way um but once again the extraction of profit <laughs> is the root i think of a lot of the damage done to our environment mm -hmm. and in our agricultural systems like it was you know it's only been a couple of hundred years since agriculture has been viewed that way as a way mm. to extract profit um, and before that once people could produce their own food you know they were free in a lot of ways you mm. know the in the enclosures were intentionally brought in to sever that connection and to sever that last bit of power people had mm. um, and interestingly and I'll just finish on this just a bit of sure. trivia well, <laughs> during Good. the enclosures <laughs> they specifically looked for shrubs uh, and varieties of plants for hedgerows that couldn't sustain people mm. that you couldn't get food from to force people into wage labour okay there I said it oh, uh -huh. I'm a red oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah I thought that was quite interesting like they knew it you know that was yeah it was done. Interesting. Caroline, what about you? What's, what's your For me, it's the habitat and biodiversity. And biodiversity mm. includes people as well, you know, because we're all dependent on the land and we need to get back and start thinking about that. And it doesn't matter whether you live in a rural area or an urban environment. We need to get rid of these Victorian views, you know, about <laughs> your garden. You know, uh, people kind of, you know, hate, they have things about what the British have done to us, but you know, I mean, gardening. Where did the Victorian garden idea the come lawn. to? The lawn, the lawn, the perfect lawn. You know, the spraying of everything, pesticide use. You know, every time we spray pesticides, we're harming ourselves. We've seen the cases from the USA. Did the Victorians? I'm not sure they were spraying pesticides. They would have. Right? They would have. They would have if they could have. If they could have. You know, I mean, they and it's really anyway. the. You know, the chemical industries has a lot to answer for, you know, it has a lot to answer for in sense of agriculture, gardening, you know, what's in our foods, yeah. what chemi you know, so, so really, who is the, <laughs> who's the source of all evil here, you know, it comes from large industries, 
and we need to get back to thinking how can we protect ourselves as people we need to protect ourselves as people by protecting the land protecting the nature that lives on that land and create the whole ecosystem and stop as Saoirse said trying to think about profits as the only way of surviving. Well, are you talking about lawns? Did you see Bernie Sanders' victory lawns <laughs> thing? No, <laughs> tell us about Bernie Sanders' victory lawns. Victory lawns, uh, it was just uh, when, you know, one little kind of policy weather balloon he put out about uh, victory lawns. So back to kind of the World War Two, you know, mm. dig for victory, this yeah. kind of uh, people growing food mm -hmm. and yeah getting biodiversity back in your lawn so he yeah. thinks it's a victory lawn which I think victory. needs to victory lawn yeah, yeah it's quite oh, the good Americans old. love branding yeah. that they thing. do yeah, yeah, they, do. And they love victory well, maybe they're right victory. maybe we should learn from others maybe yeah. we should have victory Take lawns in Galway what do yeah. you think yeah, so who's, who's for Victory Loans in Galway for two all our watchers anyway? Victory <laughs> Meadows. Loans, Victory <laughs> Meadows, yeah. Victory Meadows. Uh, and, uh, and we actually have a comment coming in here um, from Sarah Noonan, which I think is very, very good. Shouldn't manufacturers be legally obliged to make sure packaging is recyclable in the country they're assigned to? Yeah, but I like they should, but I think even just going to ban them because how good is our recycling system? Yeah. Someone was telling me once that ninety percent of it goes for uh, fuel for like concrete factories. Ninety percent. Well, oh, that well, sounds. Yeah. yeah. But I, do, I don't know. Mm -hmm. A lot um, of it, of course, was being shipped over to places like China yeah. to be thrown yeah. in the sea eventually. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, like and and even what's a, a a really hard plastic only has I think nine at the very in the best optimum conditions. Nine uses. I think it only has nine meltdowns yeah. and. I heard so I think they should just be banned yeah and even some of these projects like the you know they're using them on recycling roads and stuffs and footpaths but you know plastics break down so you're more you've more and more micro plastics mm. you know so that's not the solution either yeah you know people say oh you can make roads and all sorts of things you can out make of them a road for the electric cars yeah yeah <laughs> you know well I think David Attenborough sort of differentiated between one-off plastics which you know I, I don't think any of us can stand over and, and plastics in general because I mean obviously some plastics are used for things like um, stents and so on yeah. absolutely um, yeah and but vital plastic tiny fraction yeah tiny fraction yeah so banning them completely 100% perhaps isn't the well perhaps it is perhaps it isn't the solution but it's just something to be no, careful and obviously I wouldn't ban banning plastic stints, yeah, might be yeah, kind whatever. of yeah, y y it mightn't be politically possible. No, but I would guess, and I haven't a clue. But I guess about eighty <laughs> percent, oh, maybe more, maybe ninety-five percent of plastics are not vital. Hmm. Easily. Yeah. I don't think I've ever used a vital piece of plastic in my life. That seems to be something <coughs> that the public. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but to to my reading of it, that would seem to be something that the public in general concur with. You know, I don't Absolutely, think everybody yeah. wants to be using plastic, mm -hmm. really. They, they no. want to get rid of all this junk, but they don't seem to have any choice in the matter. Because the know? government won't legislate. But That's why not? <laughs> because yeah. they, I don't know, make the suave lobbyists. Talk yeah, about. lobbyists, I'd say, is stopping it. Mm. Well, that's one, that's one now that's... Uh, like, there's an ideological commitment in our current government to businesses. Mm. They say, who was, the, our thesis was on saying we're a pro-business party. I think by that they mean anti-regulation, pro-business, yes sir, whatever you like sir. Mm. Or maybe I'm just being cynical. No, I'd agree. Yeah, well, I, I, I would throw one thing at you. There was a certain gentleman who I won't name who, who said to me, who, who was involved with Irish sugar packaging, and he said that, um, you know, originally Irish sugar marketed in paper bags, and then Tate and Lyle came in because the European Union mm -hmm. regulations changed, and they started using plastic, plastic packaging with bright, shiny colours and all sorts of exciting things. And immediately people started buying that, mm. you know, because it was marketed very well in a clever way. So people didn't buy the old boring bag of Irish sugar in its paper mm. packaging, which was fairly environmentally friendly. Yeah, it kind of... So, I mean, people do respond to shiny plastic. Oh, absolutely, yeah. it's marketing. It's it. Marketing mm. is probably the root of all evil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we can't be market driven Not in really. these matters. I don't think, I think, you know, marketing has a lot to answer for. Mm. It's how we sell things, you know. If only we were as good at it in the environmental mm, groups. <laughs> we could sell all the solutions well, to the world. Well, maybe solution then. <laughs> environmental groups to, to get into the, the marketing. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pollution. Okay, so um, final word to Mike, I suppose. Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to thank our two guests for a very, very good discussion this morning. Saoirse, thank you very, very Thanks much. And Caroline, thank you very much. Thanks very morning. much. And uh, hopefully it was informative to the viewers. 
Yeah. You know, I'm sure I, we I get some. Myself, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh no, the McCarthy trials will be started. Yeah, the new again. McCarthy trials yeah. will be out. All right. And uh, thank you again, Neil, too, for your contribution. Yeah, thanks and very thank much. You, Mike. Thank you, and thank you, viewers, for tuning in. So, okay, so that's the end of the show. Um, please, uh, li you know, uh, share it on Facebook, and um, please sort of share it on all the other social media as well, including Instagram, which I forgot uh, in my in the previous episode. And uh, we'll see you again in the not too distant future. Thank and you. Just three people we'd like to thank before we go: uh, Rachel, Adam, and Aaron for all their help. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you.